morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school and of our medical campus, welcome to this public health conversation. These events are meant as spaces where we welcome public health leaders to our community to talk about issues of consequence for health. Thank you for joining us for today's event, in person or online. In particular, thank you to the Office of the Dean, whose efforts make these conversations possible. Now, before introducing today's program, a couple of logistics. First, today also happens to be, in exactly one hour, the Red Sox opening day. <laughs> now, I mentioned this, there's actually a reason why I'm mentioning this, because there is going to be a jet fly uh, at some point in the next hour, which apparently can be quite loud. So if that happens, that's what's happening. That's number one. Uh, second, the format of today's event is a Q&A. I will be asking Dr. Wolensky questions for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. In order to make sure that everyone on Zoom can also hear the questions, we are not going to do raised hands in the room. Everybody should have received QR codes. There's little QR codes floating around the room. So all you need to do is just scan the QR code, type in a question, and I'll have it on my iPad, and I will do my best to get to as many questions as possible. And now to the event. We have the privilege of welcoming a very special guest. Dr. Rochelle Volensky is the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Before going to CDC, Dr. Wolensky served as Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital from 2017 to 2020 and a Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School from 2012 to 2020. Originally from Maryland, Dr. Wolensky received her Bachelor of Arts from Washington University in St. Louis, her Doctor of Medicine from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and her Master of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. On a personal note, I've had the privilege of intersecting with Dr. Wolensky in various venues and I've always learned from her and enjoyed her interactions. So I'm really delighted that she's with us today. On behalf of our community, Dr. Wolensky, welcome. Welcome. Thank to, you. I'm so delighted you. to be here. All right, so we're going to start with an easy question. Let's start, <laughs> let's start a bit with your background, how you came to work in public health, your journey. Um, well, maybe first, as I just even first scan the audience, I just want to say um, I'm among mentors and friends. So it's really, it's a delight for me to be here. I'm delighted for, to have this conversation. So um, thank you to all of you who are here and supportive and who have supported and shaped me um, in, in my journey. Um, so I, uh, I, you know, I came into public health because in 1995, I was an intern. And as an intern in 1995, you admitted mostly patients who were dying of AIDS. Um, and later that year was when the cocktail was FDA approved. And all of a sudden, um, during that year, people went from a definitive death to you may not die of this disease. And there was so much work and public health work that was happening during that period of time um, and so many unanswered questions about how that path would go for those patients that I really wanted to be a part of it. And so a lot of what I wanted to do was take what I was doing at a patient level and sort of bring it to epidemiologic analyses, ultimately cost effectiveness analysis. Um, and so that was really how I started a journey in public health and learning the methods, quantitative methods, um, during my master's. Um, I, I, maybe one other anecdote, and that is people have asked me, how did I apply for this job? And the answer is, I didn't apply for this job. <laughs> um, I got a phone call one day asking if I would be interested in this job or would consider this job. Um, and sort of that's how it <laughs> that's how it happened. <laughs> and here you are. And here I am. I will say I never never in my career aspired to this. It's an amazing honor um, and an amazing privilege to have this job. But never in my career did I sort of say what I really want to do is be the director of CDC. <laughs> so, or now listen, let's move to content. So, I'm going to divide my questions into COVID and then non-COVID. All out. Let's 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 start with COVID. Um, um, Let's start with what you think were the main mistakes that we made during COVID. And insofar as you're comfortable talking about it, what mistakes you think the CDC made? And then to leaven that, also what you think we did right? Um, wow, we're going to start easy, huh? Well, the first question was easy. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, I think, first, I think it's probably worth rewinding and saying I inherited the CDC as a pretty frail organization in January of 2021. Um, the CDC director position is not a Senate confirmed position, so I was sworn in about a half an hour after the president, um, knowing that we needed a lot of work in public health immediately. 
Um, so there were mistakes that predated me, also mistakes that you know were made under my watch. I'm going to acknowledge those too. I think first thing we need to acknowledge is CDC is an agency that's 76 years old. Um, the last pandemic was 105 years ago. And so CDC has never in its history had to address um, a public health outbreak the size, scale, and scope of what we had to do in this, in this moment. Um, and so while we have been positioned to do lots of things in public health, that vast um, the vastness of that responsibility has never been, had never been one that CDC had been sort of primed for. Um, certainly, there have been mistakes that have, or challenges that have been uh, talked about in terms of lab and in terms of other um, things. Among the things that I will sort of say I, I um, look back on are um, things I think that would, would, one of the things that I would have wished for inertially is I, I said in my nomination speech, we're going to lead with science. And I stand by that. Um, I assumed, which was not appropriate, that the people who were listening understood that science would change. Mm -hmm. And um, scientists, academics understand that, but not everybody understands that. And so we should have said science and it will change, or science and for now, and this we will update and give you more information as we have it. I think one of the challenges that has happened in all of science is um, that conversations that we are used to having in academic audiences in um, scientific meetings about, you know, should we do this or should we do that? There's, there's a gap in knowledge. That is gray. We need more information on this thing. Was now a two-minute news bite on NBC Nightly News and was being digested for all of America. And that was hard, because not all of America can um, interpret the science the way people, trained academicians, interpret science. So that has been difficult. Um, and so implementing that sort of science is going to pivot, science is going to change as we have more information, not only as our science gets updated, but oh, by the way, in this situation, as the virus changes too. Mm -hmm. So that has been really hard. The other thing that I think um, CDC had been unaccustomed to is people who knowing, knowing who we were. <laughs> not your average American does not come to the CDC, or did not in 2018, come to the CDC web website to figure out how they should clean their apples, mm -hmm. you know, um, and now they were. They knew what we who we were and what we did, and now the average American was reading our guidance. And then finally, I will say, um, our guidance, and, and we've moved a lot and changed a lot in how we put, put these recommendations out, had been do this but not that. And it hadn't been sort of a harm reduction kind of approach to guidance. And so that's hard because, um, and as I've had this great privilege of traveling all of America and our, and our territories and tribes, we, our guidance has to apply to Manhattan and tribal country mm. and Guam and rural Idaho. And so one set of guidances to say that it's going to apply similarly across all of those different kinds of places, we need to provide options for what you can do in your place when you have these resources and this capacity and this sort of political will. You know, the point that um, CDC had never actually been through a pandemic is a really interesting point. I never thought of that before, 76 years and 100 years. Um, I'm going to go off script for a second. Let me pick up on the on the science, and you know, you said, I want to lead with science, and I assume that people would know science changes, and of course, scientists know that. What role do you think the, the fact that we live through this pandemic in a time of social media, which really, science has never really lived through an emergency in social media, where anybody says something, and it, by definition, because of the medium, it seems dispositive. What role do you think that played? Huge, because I think a lot of the mis and disinformation has been propagated by that. So on the one hand, and and you know the other thing is that that is where in social media and in, and in on Twitter is where scientific dialogue could potentially disagree, and that's a really fruitful. I mean, we like that kind of active discussion and disagreement, so we can't we can't tamper it. Um, but at the same time, it's not always used for productive purposes. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's actually a it's been a really interesting really difficult space right now um, for social media. It, it's um, 
and, and how I navigate social media and how I use social media has even evolved in my tenure there. Yeah, absolutely. Where do you think we stand on uh, credibility for public health broadly, CDC specifically? There was a paper, which I'm sure you saw the other day, came out in Health Affairs about right. trust, <laughs> CDC. It was, it was, sort of, it was interesting. Um, um, how, how do you feel about it? Where, where do you think we are? Well, let me just say in that Health Affairs article, I was pleased to, pleased to see that CDC was on top of the other federal agencies. So I do want to say, like, I think that trust, there we have work to do. Um, and I don't think it's CDC alone. I think all of us have work to do. Science and academia has work to do in how we demonstrate and regain that trust because it has been so politicized. One of the things that um, was the case when I came to CDC is our science was moving slowly. Um, has anybody ever tried to put a paper out with CDC co-authors? Um, I hear people laughing. Um, I, I was a co-author at the time I started CD, at CDC. And so I knew that. Um, and I had said to the agency kind of the day I walked in the door, science gets out too slowly here. Um, we have decreased our clearance time by 50% since the day I walked in the door. Um, that's still too slow as far as I'm concerned. And in fact, some of the things in terms of credibility is to be accountable and to say, if you think your science gets out too fast or too slowly, prove to me it's going to get out faster. So one of the things I think I'm really proud of is MPOX vaccine performance. We were the first in the world to put it out. And we put it out via a technical brief on our website before it, when we were pretty sure as to what the data were showing, but, and, and when it was going through peer review, so we had every intent of putting it through peer review, but people needed to know how that vaccine was working. We just, um, last week, two weeks ago, put out a technical report on where we are with avian influenza. So, so these technical reports, getting our science out faster, I fully believe in the peer review process, um, and we still need to continue that peer review process because it makes it better, but oftentimes to be action-oriented in public health, we actually need to give information in real time before it, the ink is dry on the publication. Interesting. Let me talk about the uh, politicization of science, which you just mentioned. So there's, I mean, th there's no question that we have, I mean, in this period, certainly in our professional lives, it's never been like, it's never been this bad where science is so politicized. So this is where we are. How do we get out of this? I mean, I, th I think it's easy to agree that we shouldn't be here. How, how do we move to a place where actually public health can occupy a unifying ground rather than being split as it is right now? So I would welcome academic voices on this too, because I do think we all of science has been diminished by politics. And I do think sort of being credible, being accountable, demonstrating, you know, coming back. I, I, when I meet with members of Congress, you know, when they say X, I'm like, let's unpack the data there. What do the data actually say? So, you know, one person at a time is one way to do it. Um, I do think, though, that especially in sort of the space that I'm living these days, health is health and policy. They inter, they are interrelated with politics um, by virtue of the fact that health and economy is a and school and you know name your other travel name your other you know many of your other spaces are values judgments. Do you place value on your economy being open over your risk of health? Mm -hmm. Those are values judgments. And we don't get to decide how everybody else places those values. Um, and at that intersection is politics. Do we have a role to play in shaping values? Um, I think we have a role to play in helping to understand risk. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a role to play in providing accurate science to help shape those values. But I don't think we get to say it's more important to have this amount of risk than it is to say that economy, you know, that your, your, your value on economy. And I think we all should acknowledge as we think about like some groups that have, that are, have zero risk tolerance to say, well, if an economy is closed, that has really important downstream health implications. And we can't forget about those as well. Let's move to, um, to a case of what I, I find both troubling and uh, interesting about balancing risks, which is um, these China's zero COVID policy, where we saw, and I realize there's some things you may be able to say, some things you may not, so you, obviously you'll say whatever you're able to say. 
but but certainly <laughs> the read from the from uh, the outside was that there was a draconian effort made to say we're going to eliminate risk when there was no real biological reason to believe that was possible. Then, of course, it was it was uh, re reverted and resulted in all sorts of risk. And but at the same time, these trade-offs were made where people's fundamental human rights were being sacrificed for this notion of zero risk. And I think what troubled me most about the moment is I did not see public health voices pushing back against that and from inside China that are constraints or from outside China. So I'm just wondering what our role is. What is our role at, at helping guide reasonable trade-offs, helping guide balancing risks and <coughs> other values that we should be holding central to our societies? I, I think we have a really important role there. And I think, but, but it's also, I shouldn't say but, I should say and, everybody is going to have um, a different measurement of either understanding those risks. I did a lot of work in risk, you know, risks and probabilities in decision science taught by some of you all in this room. <laughs> um, and, and even good, smart people um, who understand these trade-offs still have a hard time processing. Um, and so I think that is our responsibility. I do think there was probably more work that was done than may be apparent to the public eye in trying to understand this. And I do think when you think about what happened in the purposes of zero tolerance, zero COVID risk in China, Ultimately, what happened was there was no um, innate immunity or no infection-induced immunity, and that didn't necessarily serve them particularly well with regard to when they, sort of, when they changed their mind. Well, yeah. yeah. Can, can, can you draw a through line from what you learned dealing with the HIV epidemic all the way through COVID, you know, MPOX? Like what, what brings those together for you? Um, first of all, community. Um, so I, it is. It was so so helpful for me during MPOX to know that community, to know the advocates, to be able to pick up the phone, at, which I did almost on a weekly basis, and say, I don't even know if this is in CDC's lane, but where? What's the community feeling? Who's hurting out there? What can't you access? What are the challenges that you're that you are having on the ground? Um, we can have a whole other conversation about MPOX, but one of the real challenges was, in my mind, we in this country do not have what I call the amber alert for clinicians. How do you all of a sudden, in a heartbeat, say, there's a new disease out there that you need to know about when somebody walks in the door, um, and you need, to know how, you need to know how to test for it, you need to know what to, the questions to ask. We don't have that kind of capacity in this country at that level. And so much of what we heard early on was, I went to five clinicians and nobody knew what, I, what, what, what it was or nobody knew what to do for me. Um, and that was some of the delay. I will say the other thing, um, I vividly remember where I was in Mass General as we were having the conversations and we were talking about isolation and quarantine very early on in the pandemic. And, and people would say, well, all you need to do is quarantine for 14 days or whatever it was at the time. Um, and nobody was asking, can you do that? Hmm. <laughs> um, you know, like p these households that had, you know, eight members in two rooms and one bathroom. It's like, and, and so, so much of that I learned and was bred in, in, in taking care of patients with HIV that we just really, we, it was, and this again goes back to our CDC guidance that says, you know, these are all the things that you say we should be doing, but what's really possible? Hmm. All right, I'm now going to shift out of COVID. I'm sure it's a relief. Let me just talk about other things. I'm I've talked a little bit about COVID <laughs> over the last few years. I'm sure you have. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to ask 15 more minutes of my questions, then I'll, I'll turn to audience questions. Mm. Let me start with a, again, an easy question. What are you most proud of in terms of your work at CDC so far? The, the people at CDC are just incredible. It, it's just, um, it, it, every day is a humbling day. Um, so maybe I will just sort of give some examples. So I, for those of you working in public health, and I know like that's everybody in the room or at least thinking about it, um, our job is successful when nobody hears about public health. 
right? And that is really hard to sell. Um, <laughs> it, it is. So things like um, there were about 80,000 people who came into this country in August, a year and a half ago August, um, in Operations Allies Welcome um, from Afghanistan, quickly brought into this country. Um, we had an MMWR on this issue. There were 44 active measles cases. I don't know. Um, and none of them went to the community. That's kind of astounding from an infectious disease standpoint. Um, it was in an MMWR, but very few people, and deans might not have even known about it. This, this dean was not aware of that. <laughs> right, and 14 active mumps cases. Right. And a lot, so there was extra, that's a massive public health success. That's amazing. Um, and so when you think about those kinds of things, we had an EIS officer, this is a good sell for EIS, who repelled out of a helicopter to drop test kits to the Diamond Princess. Those are the kinds of things that people, um, or in Mubenda, Uganda, doing infection control in the middle of the Ebola Sudan outbreak. So like those are the kinds of people, now their names may not be on publications, and you didn't know about their work until I just said it, but that's the kind of people that I get to represent. So um, it's, it's pretty extraordinary, the kind of work that is happening. I could talk certainly about 673 million vaccines that have been administered in the last two and a half years. Unbelievable, biggest vaccine. Um, I could talk about the fact that like, after about a year and a half, we had complete vaccine equity in this country. In fact, the biggest challenge in vaccine equity was on the urban-rural divide. Um, not on race and ethnicity. I am really proud of the fact that within 10 weeks of my, of my showing up, we declared racism a serious public health threat. And within you know, a year, there were 200 public health departments that had done the same. Um, so there, there have been like some real, we, we established the Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics, which I think is going to be a really incredible add. So I, there's a, a lot that I think we and the CDC have to be proud of. We still have a lot of work that we are doing um, and a lot of lessons learned. Through COVID again, public health again, through COVID 2021, there were 63 foodborne outbreaks that year. Um, not many made the news, but they were all they were all sort of addressed. So um, there's just a lot of work in public health. So it's the, I, I, every week I make unsung hero calls of um, people within the agency who may or may not have had their name in the news or recognized for their work, but the, who are doing incredible work every day. Well, rappelling into the Diamond Princess with test kits also pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that story. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> um, uh, let me ask you a big picture question. You know, in public health, we often talk about um, <laughs> our role is to create a healthier world, you know, to, to build a world that supports health. What would be your vision for that, and, and how do we get there? Um, so there are lots of different ways I could go with that. So first of all, COVID happened on the top of an incredibly frail public health infrastructure. There have been some that have said that we were 60,000 public health jobs in deficit at the beginning of COVID. Um, so a, a huge amount of work that we have to do in workforce, in um, data modernization, fax machines, we're f receiving data by fax machine, um, and, um, and a, a million COVID tests a day by fax machine, um, and, uh, and laboratory infrastructure. Um, do we have a lab, you know, every jurisdiction wants us to be monitoring their wastewater and doing genomic surveillance, but does, you know, that county, does Maricopa County, Arizona have wastewater surveillance and a, and a genomic epidemiologist got the ready to, to do the analysis? So a huge amount of work that we have to do in public health infrastructure. My vision, um, and it will post-date my tenure, I, I suspect, is that that public health infrastructure has to connect with healthcare because we are the only place, probably the only country in the world where those two are siloed. And if there were an Evali outbreak, I mean, it's one thing to have a measles outbreak where it's a reportable condition, but for those things that are not reportable, an Evali outbreak, the um, e-cigarette associated lung injury outbreak, something like that, and it was sparse around a whole bunch of different hospitals, it takes forever for somebody to realize there's 
a problem because public health and health are not integrated. So I would really love to see those two data systems plug together. Um, that is sort of the infrastructure piece is a really important one, and the equity piece is a really important one. The, there are so many people, there are some, some scientific literature that suggests from the time of a new diagnostic, uh, sorry, a new therapeutic to the time it gets to community, and I just did a, a, um, an event yesterday for community based organizations, is 17 years. Um, by the time it gets published, and then it gets into the guidelines, and then yeah, academics start using it, then it, you know community members start using it, then it goes generic. You know, like it's 17 years. We can't have that delay um, if we're going to have equity in, in health around the country. Let me let me build on the equity point. Can, can we talk a little bit about health gaps, about some of the sort of intractable health disparities, health inequities in this country along multiple lines: education, income, race, ethnicity. Where where do you see the CDC playing its most important role in narrowing those health gaps? So I first we think we have to actually see them. So as you're talking about social determinants of health, I'm talking about health data and public health data, but there's like a whole other level. Like, can we link our housing data? Can we link our environmental justice data? Can we link our hot uh, climate data? Because and and in fact, you know, can we can we think about the fact that that highway was built through an African-American neighborhood to connect a suburban neighborhood with the city, and therefore there's no green trees, and therefore there's no you know, safe space. So I think that there's so much work that has to be done in that space. Let me shift topic. I want to ask about um, sort of a larger topic about commercial determinants of health, and I want to use the um, East Palestine train, uh, train derailment, which I'm sure you've, in both <laughs> your CDC hat and your ATSDR hat you've been dealing with. Um, um, I may think there's much to be said about East Palestine, but clearly, right, it's a confluence of forces largely arising from practice of the, of the corporate sector. And, uh, you know, there's more and more academic work about working with private sector to align what the private sector does in a pro-health way. Can you just talk a little bit about how you see the CDC intersecting with the private sector in a way that um, generates health, in a way that encourages, incentivizes the private sector to generate health? Yeah, I mean, there are so many complexities about East Palestine, um, and maybe, and I actually just got back from Hawaii and spent some time talking about the Red Hill oil uh, oil spill. So, so there's like a lot that was of my next question. <laughs> great. Um, so first, I think there's this regulatory piece that is really an EPA space. So we offer sort of the assessment of um, chemical exposure, but the re regulatory mm. piece is e EPA space. Um, Interestingly, in East Palestine, um, there's HHS, there's F it's EPA and CDC, there's HHS, and it bridged two regions, because um, Pennsylvania and, so there are a lot of players there in terms of both regulatory and health outcomes. So CDC's role for the most part is to assess the chemical exposure and to sort of do long-term follow-up. I think many people don't recognize that um, oftentimes in many of these, we have to be invited um, in order to be able to do that assessment. So um, we have been on the ground in Ohio, um, and what we really like to do is especially provide community information that they need to do the assessment of chemical exposure, to understand what those long-term impacts are, and then also to understand um, and do the sort of science behind what is the potential impact of those exposures be before and after they happen. And how can or does CDC work with private sector, with corporate entities, to encourage them to do things that improve health? Um, you know, that is one of the partnership areas where we have more work to do. Um, from, an e from a sort of environmental standpoint, much of that happens with the EPA. Right. Different topic, technology. So, you know, I'm often frustrated by how we discuss technology in health and public health because it's often discussed as like the panacea, the solution. At the beginning of COVID, mm. we saw this, right? Apps are going to save us. <laughs> of course, they were, they were utterly useless. Um, but, but obviously, obviously, technology <laughs> plays a role. Um, so I'm just actually curious about your thoughts on that, about your thoughts about how we can actually use technological advances to advance the health of the public in a meaningful way. 
I can give you, so you've named a bunch of examples of where it's been challenging. Um, I just got back from Vietnam, and on a Saturday in Vietnam, um, in a middle school or in a grade school, um, they were doing TB screening of elderly people. Um, they had uh, radiographs, chest x-rays, that were about six pounds that they were doing in this site, um, and uh, they were being read by AI in real time. Um, and so, and they were screening somewhere between 300 and 400 a day, a positive check x-ray, you marched down the hall and got your sputum. Um, we can do um, AI looking for cooling towers to uh, detect Legionnaires outbreaks. Um, so there is a lot of work that is happening in technology where I think it could be really helpful. One of, I, I talked, I could talk for hours about data challenges, but one of the ways that um, could be really useful is how can we use technology to protect identifiers so that we can actually have more data on more people without the threat of um, identifiers, personal PII getting out. That's interesting. Those are good examples. All right, we're gonna switch to some questions from uh, the audience now. I'll start with someone from Zoom. That's a good one. Looking ahead, the greatest public health challenges, let's, let's say, of the next decade. Well, um, <laughs> I, I was just saying ahead of this, it's been raining infectious diseases since I got to CDC. <laughs> um, and um, I don't think that's going to change. Um, Everybody thought that the next pandemic would be an influenza pandemic, um, and it wasn't. And just because we had a COVID pandemic does not mean we are protected against an influenza pandemic. Um, our emergency operations center has been continually activated since I've started um, and had already been. Um, and so I think that we will continue to see infectious disease threats. Um, and we need to be ready for the next pandemic because, you know, we, we um, I think we, we had a frail public health infrastructure coming in and we're doing a lot of work to bolster it, but it's not where it needs to be. All of that having been said, um, the people who are most impacted by infectious disease threats are those with chronic conditions. Um, and it is the intersection of those chronic conditions. And until we bridge that equity gap between the, um, the people who are dying of chronic conditions and most threatened by infectious disease threats because of those chronic conditions, we will not be ready. Hmm. Separate question, I, I quite like this one. How, how does the CDC and you handle competing priorities? And the example that's given is, the opioid epidemic, which preceded COVID and has no end in sight. And how, how does the agency balance these sort of multiple deadly diseases and the pros and cons of doing one thing which may actually well harm another? That's a great question. So um, we, I am fortunate to have an agency that is 12,000 strong, um, if not more. Um, we have different centers that are responsible for different areas. And, and I would say critically important so that and this, I think, is a perfect example. It doesn't speak specifically to opioids, but when Zika, was, when we had the Zika outbreak, we were swiftly be able to bridge our birth defect center with our infectious disease and zoonotic disease. So it was those expertise that were able to come together that allowed that response to be so effective. And so it is our ability to bridge. So when we have a challenge in, be it HIV and opioids or something like that, we can actually bridge those gaps pretty quickly. The, the next layer of that question is, in an agency that has 12,000 people, um, what happens when you have a pandemic and 2,500 of them need to be deployed to that response? That's how many people we had actively working in a response at a given time. Um, and some, so much of what I have said to the agency is we need to have a responder program. Everybody at this agency needs to be part of this response, whether you book flights for deployers or you're a subject matter expert on A, B, or C. Um, and at the time when you have to really deeply engage in a response, how do we know what to let go of? Right? How do we know the things that are not acutely important today because I really do need to tackle what's happening in that seafood plant um, or an outbreak that is happening somewhere else? Let's talk about climate change. This is a question from Paige. How is the CDC preparing for the diseases that will emerge or worsen due to climate change? I th well, CDC is the only part of U.S. government that works at the intersection of climate and health. There is an office that's being established in the Office of the um, Assistant Secretary. 
I think one of the major issues that we need to talk about is, is where those intersections occur, because I think most people don't recognize where those intersections occur. So if you go to Alaska, you do not recognize that the climate change is affecting their food security in salmon and tribes. You don't recognize in Minnesota that they've had um, some of their wells that have been overrun with water, and therefore their water security is a problem. They don't recognize the expansion of vector-borne diseases, where we're seeing Babesia now, where we're seeing Lyme now, um, and, so, and, and the environmental heat index. Uh, so I think people, are, people sort of say, climate doesn't affect me. Climate affects all of us. Um, and I think people need to start to recognize. Um, it may very well be that we need to talk about it in a language that is acceptable to, to whoever may be talking. You know, what does it mean for um, the cruise industry? What does it mean in, in language that doesn't necessarily use the word climate for everyone? Because not everybody is, is ready to acknowledge those intersections. Well, let's go from an easy topic like climate to an easier topic like firearm violence. <laughs> so um, what, um, what, the, what do you see is, is the CDC's role in, uh, it's a question from Mohammed in the room, um, in contributing to evidence-based strategies and policies to reduce firearm violence? And, what, and, and how do you see the CDC intersecting with the public health community at large on this issue? Um, so we did declare firearm violence a public health threat um, two years ago, soon after I started as well. I, you can't address this question without sort of a, a, addressing the tragedy of like even just this past week. So let me just say that as a parent. Um, how terrible and tragic and, and unfortunately common this is becoming. Um, we have had numerous um, reports on firearm violence. I think one of the big tragedies about the, in the big picture is that, um, that peop these happen when they happen in mass, in six, six shootings in a school. But you know, over 70% of homicides and over 50% of suicides are related to firearms. And so the one-offs we're not getting as, um, as we don't get the news on. Um, and yet they are so very common. Um, we do have resources now. They had been expanded under this administration to do some research now on firearm prevention. One of the um, firearm violence prevention on how do we um, how do we even have a database or a surveillance on those who have had firearm-based injuries, but not just not not only deaths. We don't even have a surveillance on that. Um, the other thing I will say, and, and this was something that I think is really important, we do have to come to terms on what we agree on across the aisle, because we, we have to get to yes. Can we agree for firearm owners and not that we do not want to have loved ones die unnecessarily of a firearm death? Let's just agree on that. If we can agree on that, is there a place, can we, I've been to a firearm training facility where they were teaching eight-year-olds to shoot. Um, what is it that you should also be teaching your eight-year-olds about safe storage, about how we engage in prevention of community-based violence? What are the things that we can agree on to say, let's get everybody to the table so that we can agree? Thank you. That's, that's actually an excellent answer. Um, let me ask a, a question from Andrew in the room um, about uh, COVID undercounts. There, there have been some papers looking at uh, undercounts of uh, COVID deaths and that, that they're particularly pronounced in low-income communities and communities of color. Can you just talk a little bit about um, the CDC, what the CDC is doing to address that? And I, I think this ties into some of your data systems uh, comments you made earlier. Yeah. Um, so there was a Washington Post piece a couple weeks ago about whether we were undercounting COVID deaths. Um, and for those who haven't seen it, in December, I'm sorry, in November 2021 or 2022, we actually had a scientific brief on how those COVID deaths get counted. Um, and I would invite people to look at that because it really, uh, Deb Howery actually just had a had a reply to that um, Washington Post editorial. Um, we have to rely on, and this will change at the end of the public health 
health emergency, lots of different ways in which we get data. Um, we can get data from the states in in um, line item way, um, and then we get data from our national health statistics in a, in a delayed, so everybody wants data fast, but they want it right, and sometimes those are mutually <laughs> exclusive. So we actually report both, and then we report the comparison. And in the comparison, they're actually not too far off. Um, but our data do report that. Our, one of the challenges that came up in this, um, in this uh, op-ed was, are we reporting with COVID or for COVID? And it is very clear that COVID has to be, for it to count in uh, health statistics, it has to be on the continue, on the pathway, the causal pathway of death. Um, so it's either, and more than 80, 70 to 80% are the cause of death, or they're a high-level contributing cause of death. That's the other 20%. So when when COVID is reported, it is reported as either uh, is on the causal pathway, and we're very clear about that. Um, it does. Maybe I'll just speak quickly to an issue related to data authorities because this is just so near and dear to my heart. We're doing so much work on data modernization, um, but I think many people don't recognize, and so I really would invite you to be part of the ongoing beat um, that we receive data at CDC volunteers voluntarily in the absence of a public health emergency. We receive data voluntarily unstandardized from, wait for it, 64 state and um, tribal, uh, 64 state and territorial jurisdictions, 3,000 counties, and 574 tribes. If it's not standardized and it's voluntary, you can imagine the kind of patchwork of data that we are receiving. And so one of the things that I would really like to do is have some standardization and some authorities for, for the data that we receive. Last week, uh, the CDC report on maternal mortality made quite a splash, appropriately. And uh, for those who didn't see it, it uh, showed maternal mortality is the its highest that it's been for about 30 years. What do you think are the um, most urgent action priorities on that? Well, I think that there's, a, a, yeah. um, some of those were related to COVID and some of them were not. Um, I, we specifically dug in to see were these increases, was there sort of a hockey stick shape, change in shape that was related to COVID and it doesn't, they were increasing before. Um, there are certainly um, racial, these are certainly under racial and ethnic divides. And part of this is getting into the community and understanding the root causes of these. Some of this is access to care, um, some of this is is uh, education and, and um, making sure that there are community-based organizations to support the social determinants of health that lead to some of these challenges. Um, we have an active engagement in this, but I will also say that um, this is also a, um, it's gonna be a moving target because many things will change after the uh, Supreme Court ruling and we have to look at that piece as well. Totally changing tack. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that um, you took over CDC at a point where it was a fragile CDC. What's the biggest lesson you've learned since you've been there? <laughs> um, in April of 2022, we took on a review. It, it was to say, like, what have we learned in this pandemic? What were we not ready for? Um, there were, we talked to over 100 people, and um, we saturated in sort of what we learned. Um, so I will tell you the five sort of lessons that kept mm -hmm. coming up. One is you have to move your science faster. We, you need to have science out in real time. Mm -hmm. Two is um, you have to have guidances that um, are implementable at all different er kinds of areas. Um, we talked about sort of the harm reduction of that. Three is that um, we needed to communicate it better and there's a lot of work. Just to give you a sense and the fragility of things, um, I inherited an agency and that has 200,000 web pages. <laughs> so we are working on an Operation Clean Slate to sort of, yeah, I see all the jaws <laughs> dropping. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, you know, are they all accessible? Or how do we archive them? What do we do with all the data that people may want to see the archives? Some people, you know, they have to talk to healthcare providers. Some have to be able to talk to public health providers. And some need to be able to talk to the whole American public. So we are working on that. So communication is a big one. Second is we need a workforce that's ready to respond. Um, and that means, you know, at CDC, 
that means at public health across the country and around, and it means public health around the world. And I'm really happy to see our field epidemiology training programs. We operate globally in 60 countries, um, and I've been to several, not all, but um, talk to country directors around the world is how we're training the next generation of public health. And in fact, we do that by creating leaders. And then finally, being a better partner. Um, the dialogue with CDC has not always historically been one of listening. It has been one of telling. And when I have said, we need to understand what are your challenges and, and pressure points on the ground and how can our work together help. That's true of public health. We haven't been a particularly always good partner of academia. We haven't been always a particularly good partner of industry. So those are some of the things that we're working on. There's a lot of questions about leadership which I want to get to, but I can't resist tying to what the last thing you said. So what have you learned about yourself and about your leadership in the time at mm -hmm. CDC? <laughs> it's not from me, it's coming from the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there has not been a lot of time for self-reflection, <laughs> I will tell you. Um, this is, it's been hard. There's no question that it's been hard. Um, my job is, I think, to make the agent, to understand the challenges within the agency and to reflect the agency in the best possible light. Um, I, you know, certain lessons, I don't read Twitter before bedtime. <laughs> I certainly don't read the comments on my post before bedtime. Um, I, uh, you know, that, um, I have to listen and read the media and then sometimes ignore it. Um, I need to know what is being said because it's, it's, um, it's uh, really critically important for me to understand what the public is reading. Um, and then I need to be able to tune it out because I can't always do my job if that is what drives me. Let's talk about communication. There's a question here about uh, from Jen on uh, Zoom. Obviously, a lot of what has happened in the past few years has been challenges in communication and communicating technical information, difficult technical information. What, um, what do you see ways in which we actually can get better, accepting the fact that the technology we're using is imperfect, that we have this fragmented media landscape, social media and all that, so that we can get better at communicating technical information in a way that public understands it? I, well, I would invite your participation, your help, because I don't think we have schools of public health that are trained in risk communications. Um, and I do think we need more training on that. I, I spent some time in, um, in a, a thinking about, like, what do we do about social media in this? How do we communicate on social media? So, but I also think that one of the challenges um, in health and public health is, and certainly through this pandemic, is everybody wants, you know, when I put my stethoscope on, um, it was, you know, I look at the guidance and I say, why or why not does that guidance apply to you and your situation? That's what healthcare providers do at this intersection between population health and, 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 um, and people wanted to know what should I do as well as what is happening in the public, at, at the population level, and that is really challenging. And so I, if I've learned one thing, it is we really, and when we talk at, at a communications level, we really need to sort of not get drilled down to the, but if you have A, B, and C, do this, and if you have X, Y, and Z, do that. It is, in general, we believe this is true, and you should talk to your provider about your specific situation. We're entering the last 10 minutes, so now we enter the advice giving part of our conversation. There are a lot of questions about advice. People want to pick your brain about that, which is wonderful. Let's start with um, universities, broadly speaking. So what, um, what do you think universities need to do, and universities broadly, schools of public health perhaps specifically, to better prepare the next generation of leaders in public health and in health? Um, first of all, I would say, and, and Applications, you, you would know better than I, but I had followed some trends over the last couple of years. My understanding is applications are up, um, and uh, at least in general. I know public health nursing, there's, the applications are up. That's really promising. It's going to take a while to, to foster the, you all, this next generation. Um, what I would say is, given the beating that has happened out there, I mean, there was just this reverence that happened in the first year, and then this beating that happened the next two. Um, it's, it's 
such an incredible field. And we just need to make sure people realize what an incredible field we are all, like, have this great privilege of being a part of. And I do think that um, that will happen because this last two years, I think, will, that, you know, that will be part of history and, and you know, people were, uh, will continue to understand what an incredible place and field this is. Um, I think um, there are areas that we need to bolster. I do think we talked about risk communications. That is going to be one um, intersection of what happens in social media, as we talked about. I do think data is going to be a really important one. I don't necessarily think we're training public health our public health youth in informatics. In fact, when I go to, to um, public health um, uh, departments of public health around the country, they say, my workforce doesn't know how to use your North Star architecture in data. Um, and so how is it that whether it's data analytics, data entry, informatics, all of those big data things that are really, we need to cross sectors in order to do that. So I think that we need some training there. Um, I think that we um, could benefit more from um, uh, externships or internships, if you will, with departments of public health. Um, we're trying to do some of that at CDC. What does it mean to be on the ground in the middle of a department of public health and the politics associated with that? What are the, the things that you have to navigate when you're in those spaces? What does that look like? We're trying to do a lot of that at CDC so people sort of understand this is what you, the guidance or your, the work that you're doing at the federal level. This is how challenging it is to implement that on the ground in LA County or in you know, in a different place. Um, so those I think, oh, and then the final one is partnership with community. I do think we had this great gift during COVID, um, if you will, and, and that is not acknowledging the, the incredible tragedies that COVID delivered to us. But, but one of the gifts is that we raised up community-based organizations and we got to community. Um, and we are at deep risk of losing those connections because we don't have resources necessarily for them. And so I think it's going to be critically important to foster those connections. And I think academia can play a really important role in the implementation with community. I hear over and over again from community-based organizations that they want to apply for a grant, but they don't know how, or they don't have the resources to, or they need help. And so that is really, I think, an important place that academia could contribute. Can you name two or three skills that every public health graduate needs? Uh. <laughs> it cannot be more than three. Um, stamina. <laughs> That's a good one. We don't have a class of stamina right now, but uh, we are working on it as we speak. Uh, wow. Um, it was stamina, stick-to-itiveness, what, whatever it is, because like you really do need to pursue hard stuff, um, and so that that I think is really um, uh, humility. I think is another one. Um, you know, there are so many different flavors of what you can do in public health. Not everybody needs to be a good communicator. Not everybody needs to be a good informatician. Um, but, but you know, some sort of sweet spot skill set. I think um, ex subject matter expertise. What it, uh, du jour is is sort of the third. I think. Like stamina, stick to itiveness, humility, and knowing your stuff. Yeah, pretty. Those much. are two. Okay, got it. Um, um, from uh, Nicole in the audience, as a successful woman in the public health field, what advice do you have for young women specifically entering the field? Young women. Um, so I, I would say um, embrace it. Um, every once in a while, and as a, I, I will tell an anecdote as a junior faculty member, I was invited, and maybe not so junior, I was invited to give a talk. Um, and if it's the Nicole, I think it might be, then she might, she might even know this story. Um, and that is, um, and I was told we need a woman on the podium. Um, so one might have said, well, I'm not giving that talk. Um, but instead I said, I'm going to give that talk and it's going to be the best talk I ever give. Um, and because of that talk, I'm going to be invited to give more. So um, sometimes it, you just need to embrace it. Um, um, last two questions. Number one, 
mistakes. What mistakes do you want to ward the future leaders in public health away from? Um, I, I think the biggest one is how is backing down after you've made them. Um, because yes, we're going to make mistakes. That's what makes us human. And so, um, you know, where are there moments that I wish I hadn't said A, B, or C, or hadn't done X, Y, or Z, or wish I could have taken that moment back? Um, wish that that headline and that photo wasn't like that, you know? <laughs> um, but but um, you just got to pick yourself up and, and keep going. Um, so, so I think the biggest mistake would be to, um, to cower under any of them. That's excellent. Well, you get the last word. What, um, what do you want um, our academic community, public health, medicine in the room, and particularly our the future leaders in these fields over the next 20, 30, 40 years to know? What do you want them to take away from this conversation? Um, maybe just a couple of things. First is um, I never thought I was going to be an AIDS doctor. Um, I, I thought I would, I thought I was going to be a dermatologist, frankly. <laughs> um, and I took this like a cute turn when HIV was happening in front of me. And so um, I didn't expect it. It was not necessarily something I was um, embracing. And in fact, I almost resisted it. Um, so like when those atypical, not even atypical, but when those turns come your way, don't be afraid to pursue them. Because um, it really could be, you know, the things that like when you're in your pajamas, and you'd rather read that paper than go to bed. That's what you should do, right? Um, that's because that's what's gonna really like motivate you. Um, I would say ask big questions. Um, I have a dear friend and mentor who says if it was easy to answer, somebody else would have done it. Um, the hard ones are really hard, um, and so don't be afraid of the pursuit. Um, I generally say surround yourself by people who are smarter than you. Um, and don't be afraid to do so. Um, and don't be afraid to surround yourself by people who will you know, tell you you're wrong um, or tell, give you an, a different point of view because that's actually what makes us all richer. Um, and then I, I will generally say, um, step into things that feel bigger than you can handle. <laughs> I say that with the utmost humility. <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, that is what keeps you engaged. If you're not, like, a little bit nervous for your next step, then um, it's not big enough. Dr. Wolinski, thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>to, to everybody in the audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining this conversation. And thank you for everything you are doing for health. Everybody have a good afternoon.